salute. This is the real buzz with Divine and CT. Joining us, our friend Mark Berman of the New York Post. We're sharing Christmas buzz. Nick's real talk for your stocking while the holiday streets are buzzing. How are you, Mark? Doing well. Uh, you know, happy holidays. Merry Christmas to you guys. It's coming up uh, not only Christmas, but the Knicks Atlanta on Christmas Day. We'll see who's healthy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we're excited about that. We're looking forward to that game. But, um, Mark, let me ask you a question. With the COVID situation around the league, the Knicks COVID effect, is it affecting the Knicks in a certain way? I mean, what do you think about the league right now with all this COVID that's going on? It's just crazy right now. The variant is running amok all over the place. And it just is pretty tough right now. I mean, what's your thoughts on um the league and as far as the Knicks COVID situation? Do you think they're going to be able to maintain this thing and, um, you know, have a deep roll out, Shelton out? Hall, Tyler Hall question, Luke of Samuel's question, pretty tough with um, the Knicks in the league right now. What do you think about the stuff going on right now? I think that the safety measures that they took last season uh, have not been in place this year. And even with all this outbreak, I'm in Boston in a small little room with Thibodeau and Kemba Walker uh, late Saturday night. Thibodeau and Walker didn't have masks on. Then the night before, or two nights before in Houston, I'm in a small room with Miles McBride and Emmanuel Quickly. They didn't have masks on. And we're right, you know, me, Steve Popper of Newsday and one of the MSG Network producers. And... I don't know. It's like the next day, Miles and quickly, you know, are in health and safety protocols. So, and there was no reaction. The NBA is just letting it fly right now. They're desperate to get to Christmas Day. That's the big revenue day for the league. Five games, national TV. I'm trying to wonder, and some people in the league are wondering if Silver is trying to get the NBA to Christmas and then after that reevaluates and maybe puts a pause on the season for 10 days because this is out of control. The Boston and Knicks game, both teams had six players in COVID-19 protocol. Last season, the Knicks never had more than one player, and that was, uh, you know, a month apart. Derek Rose had, an in, had COVID, and so did Alec Burks, but uh, they never were missing more than uh, one player. Yeah. Do you think? Do you, do you know? Do you know if um like if Obi Toppin got they've been out for a while. You think they should be back pretty soon? Do you think they'd be back for Christmas? Cause they've been out for a minute. Yeah, I think they'll be back by Christmas, but I don't think for uh against Detroit Tuesday night okay. did not sound like that in practice. They're still in safety protocols. Listen, the new rules are all you need is two po uh, negative tests in 24 hours, a span of 24 hours. So. Like if one of these guys tests negative, uh, you know, at four o'clock today and then tests negative four o'clock tomorrow, maybe they could suit up. But they're out of condition, haven't practiced. Uh, I don't know if any of the six guys are going to be ready, to be honest. Again, you could rush them into a game, but without a practice you know, maybe it's not the smartest thing, especially coming off COVID. I'm told that none of these guys really had symptoms, but they don't know anything about what COVID-19 does to an athlete in the long term and bringing him back to play a, a NBA game all of a sudden after just having it, you know, you never know. But I don't see the six guys, any of the six guys coming back. But by Christmas, I think more than half of them will suit up. Yep. Yeah, it's always yeah, safety first, first and foremost. And um, yeah, you, you're reporting, obviously, uh, Damian Dotson, the New York Knicks have reached out for some help and they've looked to a familiar face. Um, you know, how did, how did that come about, Mark? I mean, I wasn't even aware that Damian wasn't in the league, but he played two seasons with Cleveland after leaving the Knicks and then was invited to camp on a non-guaranteed deal and was cut. So he wound up in the G League with the Austin Spurs. And, you know, he's playing pretty good. He's averaging 13 points, nothing special. But he's not a big scorer. He could shoot the three. But, you know, he doesn't handle the ball. He doesn't really create his own shot. But he's a good defender with size. A Thibodeau-type player, actually, even though 
as we remember, he was drafted by Phil Jackson and uh, back uh, with Frank Nilakina in that same draft of 2017. Uh, will he play tomorrow? Probably. Uh, they played eight men last, uh, eight men in Boston. One of those players was Wayne Selden, who's really, I don't think he's an NBA player, in my opinion. So we may see Damian uh, in his second, second stint against Detroit. Uh, you know, listen, Scott Perry knows a lot about Damian's character. They're very, very fussy when it comes to signing a player like this. They want to make sure he fits in the locker room. And they there's no issues with Damian Dotson. He's, he's a very good character guy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I remember that first time with the Knicks. I was surprised that they didn't bring him back. But, um, you know, I guess that's how the ball bounces sometime in the NBA where, you know what, they just feel like they're going to go another way and get another player that they can get. So, you know, but I'm glad they brought him back because Dam Damian Dotson, like that, he'll help the team tomorrow night, you know, for sure. Um, you know what, you know, and for, as far as that, um, you know, with the Kimmel Walker situation, that's a pretty tough thing going on right now. And the Fournier thing, um, do, do, you know, I know these guys – after last night, you know, the other game of Boston, after the press conference, you heard Tim Walker saying that he want to play, but Tibbs hadn't spoke to him and all this thing. Do you think that thing is is, is going to run the course and he probably wind up just moving them? What's your thoughts on the Kim Walker and Fournier thing in New York? Yeah, I don't think you could trade him now during this COVID outbreak. Uh, and I think it will give pause for the Knicks to deal him unless they're getting something they really like back uh, because, you know, you never know when the next COVID positive is going to be. So he's a good depth piece. But as far as him getting his prior role back, I mean, Tom Thibodeau is such an ego. He made this decision, and he looks like he's going to stand by it. He'll probably start tomorrow, though. Uh, it didn't sound like Derrick Rose was healthy enough to return against Detroit uh, with a sprained ankle. He's had a bulky ankle for a lot of the season and he keeps re-aggravating it. I know it's not a good time to like really let it heal completely, but is it is the Pistons, the worst team in the league. Uh, so I, I just don't see Rose playing. I do see Kemba back as the point guard starting. I don't think he'll play 36 minutes. I think he kind of ran out of steam in the fourth quarter in Boston. I think, uh, you know, with Dotson there, they're able then to, extend the bench a little more so um yeah as far as Kemba he'll be traded at some point I just don't think I thought it would be more immediate before the COVID outbreak but I think he'll stick around the tension between the two is pretty obvious it it, it didn't feel right after the game Thibodeau was very clipped he complimented him said he played really well very well but he wasn't effusive in any way. And possibly, you know, they lost the game and Kemba didn't really didn't really have a big fourth quarter. So that was probably another reason Thibodeau wasn't so effusive. But the fact that Thibodeau has not really talked to Kemba at length or in any way, shape, or form to explain this is a bad sign. And it's to me bad coaching. I think communication is so important in the NBA as a head coach. And Kemba, all he talked about was Johnny Bryant, the assistant coach who has been working with him, who's been in his ear, who's been encouraging him. And and it should be noted that Johnny Bryant was not hired by Tom Thibodeau. They did not know each other at all when Johnny joined Thibodeau's staff. That was William Wesley who brought on Johnny Bryant. Yeah. Yeah, the whole... The whole Kemba can only start or he doesn't play sort of thing just hasn't quite sit right with me. Um, I think he can do good things off the bench. Now, I don't know if it's on Kemba's end where he doesn't want to come off the bench, but there's definitely the chemistry like we touched on last time, Mark. Just I think since the two new additions, the chemistry has just never been the same. And Randall himself has never been the same this season. You know, and, and some of the vets and young players, the work ethic that we spoke of and them coming into the gym late nights, it just seems like that that camaraderie is now a little bit off kill. Well, Julius uh, and Kemba, it just didn't work. Uh, and even the other night, Kemba comes back. Kemba has a big night, and Julius struggles. 
uh, they never seem to play well at the same time. They don't play well off each other. I think they needed more time, but Thibodeau obviously thought differently. Uh, Julius is not only struggling on the court, I think he's struggling to be the leader of this team. The Knicks need him to be the leader, uh, but I don't think because he's struggling, Julius doesn't have an in him. He's he's not. I, I even see it on the court. It's like when he's missing shots, he's not energetic. He's not encouraging his teammates. But then when he starts hitting shots, I see him all like, you know, patting everyone on the back and everything. But he needs to be like that all the time. And listen, last season was fluky. It was before no fans or 1,900 fans. And Julius Randle excelled in that environment. Once we got to the playoffs and the Garden had 16,000 screaming fans and Atlanta was jam-packed, at State Farm Arena, Julius didn't play that well. Someone said it's easy to hit three-point shots in an empty gym. It's a little tougher when you have uh, a full house, you know, and sort of a bedlam-type atmosphere. So maybe we're seeing Julius Randle the way he once was, back to normal. I mean, normal for Julius was sort of an inconsistent, very talented player, but not a winning player. And I hate to say that because the Knicks have put so much investment into Julius, and I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, it, it is a different type. He is playing a different type of ball this year compared to last year. But like you said, last year the Knicks caught everybody by storm. They were under the radar. There wasn't a lot of expectations. Um, you know, but like for us, Tibbs, you know, I've been hearing some stuff out there. Do, 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 you, have you, do you think this tip, this team is starting to – I don't want to say turn tune him out because I think that'd be the wrong word to say. I don't know Tim is well respected coach, but his coaching style, he, he demand a lot from players. Do, do you think like guys uh, would feel like they tuning him out because of his coaching style? Or you think that just really not the case? It's just that they just playing bad basketball. I think there's something to it, and I think some players were a little turned off in how he handled the Kemba Walker situation because it could happen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden, the starting point guard can't get into a game for nine straight games, even as the Knicks became shorthanded. I think that was the head scratcher. It's one thing to make the move, but then when you get a couple of uh, COVID-19 uh, protocols and he still couldn't get in the game, he couldn't get into the game until six guys were out with COVID and Derek Rose goes down with an ankle injury. So... It was disrespectful to someone who has accomplished so much in his career as a four-time All-Star and also a great guy. I mean, all the players talked about how well he handled the demotion, still uh, in practice, lively and encouraging. And you saw him on the bench. I'm sure they panned to him or you could see him. I mean, being live at the game, I was very – curious and kept watching Kemba and he was always up on his feet clapping. I will say mm -hmm. the one time I did notice that he wasn't as energetic was in Houston because that was ridiculous. That was ridiculous that he didn't get into the game. Although it worked out. You know, Miles McBride played the entire second half and played it well. So Thibodeau rolled with him. But it's still it, that must have been a, a real sucker punch to Kemba that he couldn't get into the game in Houston after Derrick Rose went out at halftime. Yeah, I, yeah, I bring that up because I also, you know, with the Mitchell Robinson situation, him getting benched um, and things of that nature. So I just wonder these guys just starting to feel some type of way. But maybe that's just part of part about being a being being coach under Tom Thibodeau. He's a real and a tense guy. He's really um, detail oriented. If you can't play D, you don't play. Blah blah blah. But um, let's hope this thing don't go too far away because uh, we want Tom Thibodeau to lead these boys to where we need them to go. So, but it is interesting to see all this going on. And then you know with De him, uh, Kimba Walker, Mitchell Robinson, these guys. It, it just is. It's not fun being a Nick fan seeing the coach and the players had to go through this stuff. That was pretty you know, pretty interesting. Yeah, listen. The history shows that Thibodeau does wear out some of his players and it's only his second season we're not even at the halfway mark i'm hoping that hasn't happened 
I know Julius Randle stands by him. Obviously, he's got Derrick Rose in his corner, Taj Gibson. But even Derrick Rose, when we asked about Kemba, Derrick seemed a little ambivalent. Julius Randle has been the only player, when asked about the Kemba demotion, that seemed excited. I mean, legitimately excited. And I think the first time he was asked about it, he says, you're going to see this team really take off soon. And everyone else was like RJ, definitely Evan Fournier. Everyone else seemed to be a little more hesitant and a little more respectful. Julius showed no respect for Kemba. Uh, he just said that, uh, you know, you know, the, this is what the coach thinks we need. And I think we're going to be really good, you know, switching on defense. I mean, he, he sounded like Thibodeau. I mean, it was weird. Yep. And, um, Mark, the, uh, the transaction season's obviously underway now. Um, you reported very recently Eric Gordon. Um, there's, there's potentially some interest from the New York Knicks end. Uh, he's a veteran that can defend, can shoot. Um, you know, so that's really interesting for us. You know, um, he is friends with um, Derek Rose. Obviously, you reported that growing up. Um, they shared a, a bond. Um, why don't you just talk to us about that a little bit and also any other names that you've heard that the New York Knicks might be linked to? I mean, Derek uh, and Eric actually played together on an AAU team one season. Uh, Eric can play point guard also. And uh, in fact, uh, in the the Houston game, he played the point guard. And he could really – I mean, he didn't shoot the ball well that night. But he he was able to get into the lane and get to the basket. And he dished out nine assists – so he really showed something. If Thibodeau was like really watching carefully, he showed that he could handle the one. And he's a dogged defender. Derek Rose has a bond with him. And the Rockets are, what do they need Eric Gordon for? You know, Eric has a big contract. The question is, would the Knicks decide that Evan Fournier was a mistake and put him in a deal for Eric Gordon? Uh, they, they uh, Fournier has... A, a more years on his contract than Gordon, but they don't, they're close to the same. And that would be the big interest to Gordon Boulder. He'll be 33 on Christmas, I believe. But he's, he's been in the playoffs a lot. Fournier has not. Uh, he's a big three-point shooter, a better three-point shooter than Fournier. And he can create his own job. And it's a crazy thought of a Fournier type of a situation. But listen, there's other guys. Listen, they need a stretch four or stretch five. They have essentially all their big men can't shoot from the outside. You just look at the centers with Noel and Mitchell, um, you know, down the line, Jericho Sims, Todd Gibson. Uh, nobody could shoot a jump shot. Taj tried a couple of, I think he hit one three the other game, but for the most part, he bricked them. Uh, you know, Mitchell will never be able to shoot a jump shot. It doesn't look, there's no progression in his fourth year from his rookie year. Uh, so Miles Turner is the player that they have really coveted. The Pacers have always wanted a, a boatload in return. I don't know if that's changed. Kevin Pritchard looks like he wants to start over. But Miles Turner could block shots and he could shoot the three. So that's, you know, a focus for the Knicks if they could get Miles Turner. Uh, I don't know what kind of package it would take, though. There's another stretch four out there in Kelly Olenek with Detroit. I don't know if he's hurt. They may see him tomorrow. They they signed him to a nice contract last season. Again, the Pistons are horrendous. They don't need Kelly Olenek. He's a veteran player. Maybe the Knicks could steal Olenek like they stole Derrick Rose. But the Knicks are going to want to make moves because what they put together in the offseason didn't seem to work. The chemistry wasn't there. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that that, that seems to be the case, man, because um, I just think that with with, with some of the young guys that we got in here now, wanting to give them opportunity, um, we definitely need a stretch shooter. We do. We really need a stretch five out there. So I definitely could see his name out there. Um, I always thought about guys like Kristen Woods and all these guys, but you no, know, it's remained to be seen who's going to move who. With the COVID situation, you don't know what these teams going to do now. They need to stand pat and uh, it's not not out there, you know. But um, it's a good point. That might hurt some trade situations. First of all, you could sign a uh, multiple players right now, but I think 
some teams might be worried about trading a, a pretty good piece because they feel they may need that piece as insurance. But Christian Wood is a good name. The Knicks really liked him when he was a free agent. Uh, you know, he, he's a scorer, can shoot. And when I was talking about they don't have the outside shooters in the big man position, I just mentioned the centers, but Toppin is shooting 20% from three-point range, and Randall has gone Randall, from a very yeah. good three-point shooter at 41% down to 33 34%. And listen, they don't guard Randall right now from the three. They want him to shoot. They they realize he's not in a in a good way right now, and they're laying off Randall, which hurts a lot of ways because if they're laying off him, he's not as dangerous driving the ball because they're not packed up on him at the perimeter. So he's got a, a little bit of a disadvantage when he goes to the basket. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mark, yeah, before we let you get out of here, um, when you talk to us about your latest story, uh, I think you, you dropped a few stories Um today or, or over the last few days? Well, I mean, the, the one offbeat piece I did was talking to the Bing Bong guy. I don't know if you like have read stories about him. Jordy Bloom is his name. He's the one that shouted Bing Bong uh, into the microphone uh, in that viral video uh, after the season opener with that garden celebration outside the arena. And he's gotten a little bit of a celebrity status. But, you know, I he's been emailing me, and I talked to him on the phone. Uh, I had reached out to him. I did see him tweet that he had COVID. And I thought it was, you know, kind of ironic that the Bing Bong guy also has COVID. Mm -hmm. And he talked about um, – he actually – you know, we both agreed that they're overusing the Bing Bong in the arena – uh, the game entertainment staff has been using the bing bong after three point shots. And they're supposed to be like big three point shots, not the ones that cut the 16 point deficit to 13 points, which they've done a few times. And he's at almost every game and he says, that's not how bing bong should be used. But it, it is a fun thing. I mean, they, they say the bing bong on the scoreboard and then the fans answer back bing bong. But Mike said it too once. Different. Yeah, but on social media, anyway, part of the story was on social media, he's been taking uh, quite a bit of heat from fans saying that Bing Bong has cursed the Knicks, which obviously is ridiculous, but it's made for a fun story. Oh, okay, yeah, the only curse the Knicks is the Knicks right now. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, exactly. What's your routine? I mean, you know, we got we got the X, uh, X Mass Day coming up, match up against Atlanta. But what, what do Bart Berman do around Christmas time? What's your Christmas Day um, routine? And what do you like to do around the Christmas time uh, other than watch basketball all day like all of us? Well, I mean, every almost every Christmas the Knicks are playing. So, mm -hmm. and, and for some reason, they seem to always play at noon. So, like, Christmas morning, like – for a new game, Tom Thibodeau talks to the media at 10, 15 in the morning or pretty early in the morning on Christmas. But, uh, yeah, listen, we were in Boston. My wife came up uh, to enjoy the weekend in Boston, and it was just such a – even with COVID, I'll tell you, it was a mob scene with the Christmas shopping, Newberry Street. Uh, if you've been to Boston in the Copley Square area, it was just – looked like, you know – uh, Manhattan, you know, like Eighth Avenue and Fifth Avenue on in Manhattan. It was, it was a real lively uh, scene in Boston this weekend, and uh, you know we'll be traveling Christmas week after Christmas Day. The Knicks have that horrible road trip if it comes off. If the season isn't paused, you got Detroit, Minnesota, then to Oklahoma City, and then to uh, Toronto. Although I will back off of Toronto. Too many COVID testing. Uh, tests are needed. So all the writers aren't going to Toronto. And in fact, we think that the Knicks caught some of the COVID in Toronto because when they came back, the positives started to pile up. But yeah, Christmas week, I'll be traveling all around the Midwest and those airports are going to be really, really busy. Uh, always is uh, during the holidays. Yeah, and um, blessings to Clyde too, who I haven't yes. heard much update on on Clyde's health, but um, all of yeah, us out told, here. We... Yeah, told, you know, he's 76 years old. Uh, obviously took all the, the the vaccination shots. Told he was doing pretty well, you know, wasn't really having 
symptoms. Again, I, t- I was told all the Knicks uh, have been doing great. Not great, but, you know, they haven't been really sick. Uh, and also Rebecca Harlow, uh, the Knicks uh, talented sideline reporter, uh, also uh, came down with COVID after the Toronto game. And, you know, in Toronto, she's in the small interview. Well, it wasn't that small, I was told. I was told it was a little larger than most of the uh, makeshift interview rooms. She's in there with R.J. Barrett, who had a uh, who had a homecoming for Toronto, so he spoke after that game, and Obi Toppin, who had a great game in Toronto. And then, you know, without their masks on, and they're talking to uh, Rebecca and a couple other reporters who were on site. And then, sure enough, you know, Obi and Barrett tested positive uh, upon the return, and soon after, so did Rebecca. So it's dangerous right now, you know, traveling and all, but... You know, it's the NBA is status quo right now. Uh, they, they haven't. Uh, I'm waiting for the situation to become like last season, where it was all Zoom, where all we did was uh, talk to the players on Zoom uh, as opposed to in person. But the NBA has been reluctant to go that route yet. But I have a feeling that might happen in January. Gotcha. Yeah, on that note, um, you know, well, Rebecca Harlow, you be safe. Congratulations you on your on the upcoming birth of your child. Um, be safe out there. All you guys, markets that 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 over that um Omicron is a hot mess right now. It's all over the place, and um, you guys just be safe, man, and um, take care of yourself, protect yourself the best you can. And we appreciate you coming on the real buzz, giving us your time as always, um, keeping us in the loop of what's going on and nicking around the NBA, man. And um, you enjoy your Christmas, you and your family. Be safe. And I'm um, just take care of yourself out there, Mark. It's pretty tough out there, man. We need you to be back on, so you take care. Of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Divine CT. Always enjoyed. You guys do a great job, and uh, I'll hopefully be on again. Uh, okay. Hopefully, this good. Week we'll continue on. We'll, yeah. we'll, we can pray. But happy holidays, guys. Thanks for the invite. Likewise, thank you, sir. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas to everyone out there. And Mark, yeah, we'll definitely catch you soon in the new year. Uh, be well. Um, but yeah, guys, keep a lookout for our Real Buzz coming on Christmas Eve. I'll be doing a giveaway um, from the Real Buzz. Um, appreciate you, Mark, and um, everyone stay well and see you on the next.